Hi, right, good morning. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm glad to be here um, representing Ireland. Um, like I say, I'm going to be talking a bit about Spain. Now we're going to hear about a bit about Ireland um, and particularly about the 1916 Rising. So first a disclaimer, I'm a sociologist first. Uh, so, you know, most of you guys are archaeologists. So I'm coming from a, a slightly different perspective. Um, my background, my PhD is sociology of nations and nationalism. My interest is in, you know, how national identity and nationalism has been reproduced and hence uh, I started my PhD in 2015 and the lead up was 2016, which is the 100 year anniversary of this big pivotal event in Ireland, the 1916 Rising. So it was a perfect alignment for my interests and my studies to focus on this kind of renewed sense of Irishness and Irish national identity. So, you know, from the sociology of nationalism, these events, these rituals, these events of kind of high social density. Um, uh, kind of renegotiations and re and new attempts to see about you know kind of what it is what you know how the history and what it is to be Irish and how this is reflected so on and so forth. So my focus is not so much on what happened in 1916; it's on 2016. It's on the social fabric of the present, you know, um, and how the ha history has been used to renegotiate and create a new sense of Irishness and create these collective identities and so on and so forth. So, a quick kind of rundown, I'm not sure how familiar you are with Irish history. Uh, the 1916 Rising, it was only a week long kind of armed insurrection uh, during the Easter week, uh, which is 24th to 29th of April. <coughs> so, it was uh, about 2,000 soldiers, rebels, volunteers, they came out and they took over. Originally, it was supposed to be all of Ireland, but, you know, failed communication, it ended up just being Dublin. And it was made up of these three main factions. The Irish volunteers, these were cultural nationalists. They wanted an independent Irish state for the renewal of Irish language and culture. Then you had the Irish citizen army. These were made up of uh, socialists. Okay, They wanted a republic, an Irish republic, to be a socialist republic as well. And then the third kind of faction, coming to mind, which was uh, a feminist uh, nationalist group. So all these three came together, all kind of wanted the same republic, and all came out and fought on, in Dublin in 1916. Now, it was a failure, it only lasted a week, and uh, it didn't really have much say with the, uh, the British establishment. Um, and afterwards, the, the couple of months afterwards, 16 of the main leaders were executed in Clement and Jail uh, by firing squad. So politically, socially, um, it had very little kind of uh, bearing on the development of the Irish political um, project. However, it's very important symbolically. Okay. And this is where we intersect with kind of the ideas about the nationhood, because all nations have this idea, or try to create this idea of the myth of origin, this, you know, this great fantastic story of where the nation came from, and a defining moment where people came together. So 1916 is offered as the Irish kind of uh, you know, response to that, that's the myth of origin. It's symbolic, it's a mythical idea of this is where Irishness was born, and this is where the Irish state was born. Now I don't have time to go into the problems with that history about that, that it's not the birth of the Irish political state now, that was the Irish Civil War, which was in the 20s and 30s. It's not the birth of the Irish nation, because there was the Gaelic Revival period, which was the end of the uh, 18th, 19th century. So, but it doesn't matter, as with all you know, history in relation to the nationalism, the history doesn't really matter, it's all about this kind of, uh, what people believe and this kind of uh, project for it. So as I said, you know, the modern state is derived from the Irish Civil War, particularly uh, the Irish Free State, which came after. Um, but, um, more on to what I'm going to be talking about today. So my PhD is on the speeches, um, particularly of these two people here. I'm not sure if you know who they are. This is President Michael D. Higgins, uh, still Irish President at the moment. This is the then Taoiseach and the Kenny. Um, so, here we have, he's a, originally he's a Labour uh, politician, he's quite a left wing and he's an academic. He's also a sociologist himself. And then we have Andy Kenny, which is a more kind of uh, right wing, kind of conservative for Fianna Gael um, politician at the time. So these were kind of the two main figureheads in Ireland in 2016. Uh, Andy Kenny since um, has moved on and we have now have Leo Varadkar. Um, and the speeches are sourced throughout uh, mainly the two years because there was a build up um, beforehand, but mainly uh, in the Easter week in 2016 was the kind of the culmination of all the state events. So again, my interest is in how the state is using or what using this history to try and create and reproduce this idea of what Irishness is. Um, so, 
quickly about my theorem kind of perspective. So, like I said, I'm focusing on rituals, and I've been trying to formulate this a new idea about uh, what I'm calling rituals of exclusion. So that you see Emile Durkheim there is very important in uh, sociology of nations, nationalism. The idea about you know rituals, people come together. You know they you know they have an activity, an event. They project onto these symbols, onto these these codes of morale, behavior, so on and so forth. Um, but you know he's he's stuck in this idea about uh, functionalism and you know you kind of rationalize everything. So you know conflict and everything is is all part of the system kind of thing. So I'm trying to move away from that a little bit. And I'm trying to look for more nuance. You know I'm trying to argue that society is stratified. So these rituals are stratified as well. And the ideas in these events. And um, don't always, you know, kind of benefit everyone equally in society. That some ideas that are being, you know, kind of held up as sacred can benefit some individuals more than others. Don't want to get too much in it. Also, then, you know, this idea about the means of ritual production: who gets to own or who gets to, you know, kind of uh, reproduce these ideas in the ritual? Where did they come from, and how are they kind of put brought to the fake? Um, I'm going to try and talk a little bit about these, not too much. So, like I said, focus today is on. The legacies of violence. I'm looking at kind of obviously the Northern Ireland Troubles, which came um, obviously in the late 60s, uh, and particularly coercive confinement and the oppression of women and the state kind of uh, implemented policies, which, you know, kind of systematic violence against women in the Irish state after uh, its independence. Uh, so these, both these legacies of violence cast a long shadow on the commemorations in 2016. Um, and what is covered is again to do with the ideas that are dominant at the time, and this kind of idea about the, what I was saying, the ritual means of production. But uh, in 2016, we've seen a large focus of feminist equality groups, so women were included into the narrative. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about how I find it a little bit problematic the inclusion. I can't get too much into it. But they were included anyway, whereas uh, Am Republicanism, the kind of Republic, which was a primary goal of the 1916 rebels, was completely excluded. And I'll talk a little bit about this juxtaposition further on the way. And I said, this, uh, is, I'm trying to demonstrate this model of the idea of that it's both about inclusion and exclusion. It's about creating group solidarity and ideas of Irishness, but also it's excluding ideas that, you know, we don't necessarily want to have at the same time. So it's two kind of sides of the same kind of coin. Um, so first thing, uh, throughout my study, um, I've come up with seven discourse strategies. I use critical discourse analysis. I'm not going to get too much into this, but um, these discourse strategies are reoccurring patterns in speeches of discourse, which are trying to put across a certain kind of argument or strategy. First, what I'm talking about today is uh, number seven. It's about um, inclusion um, and this reoccurring theme of constructing how great and how inclusive these commemorations are. Now, the focus is largely on, like I said, that 2016 was the first real time that women were reintegrated back into the narrative of 1916. Um, so this was a reoccurring theme throughout the course of um, the 2016 commemorations. So over 300 women participated in the 1916 Rising. Again, they made up that common amount, that Irish nationalist feminist kind of uh, group on the ground. And they had a really important role in the conflict. Um, they, not only were they fighting with the men alongside them, that they were very important in, you know, kind of bringing communications throughout the different kind of factions that were spread across Dublin city centre. Um, but Unfortunately, um, after independence, when the Republic came into play, their role in the story of the uh, 1916 Rising was marginalised. And post-Civil War, even kind of tra most tragically, they, uh, um, they were marginalised from society as well. You know, during this period, from about 1916 to 1921, a little bit further, women had this renewed kind of... Uh, had, a lot of them were lawyers, a lot of them were involved in the nationalist movements and stuff, but then you know, when the, the Republic came in, they were marginalised, they were pushed to, to the home and course of and so on and so forth. It's kind of a, the biggest tragedy. And again, they were removed from the narrative of 1916. It was all focused on mainly the men and mainly the, the leaders. Their role, as I said, was expunged from the historical narrative. So 2016 was this first time when it was, we're bringing the women back in. It's, you know, kind of, it's a focus on the women again. So. Diversity and inclusiveness was a reoccurring trope in all the speeches, in the whole state events. It was kind of like, oh, it's 2016, we're, in, we're a nation that, you know, we've had in Ireland in 2014 the equality referendum, you know, it was the idea that Ireland is trying to refashion itself around being an inclusive, a diverse, a great kind of country. So this was a, a big idea that kept being championed by both Ender Kenny 
and President Higgins. Uh, however, I'm arguing that it was a little bit more focused on political advertising than actually including the women. Uh, certainly more so than Andy Kelly, it was a lot more about uh, advertising his establishment and the state and the, all these great commemorations. Uh, President Higgins focused a little bit more on the role of women and so on and so forth. But women were mentioned, often in passing, but there was a much more attention focused to look how great and inclusive we are, rather than actually saying, you know, including women into the actual story itself. So, as I said, uh, the commemorations are kind of a zeitgeist of Irish society. They're really focused on equality and, and uh, you know, but there's still these structures in Irish society which uh, make it harder for women to uh, have an equal footing. Um, so this inclusion, it does symbolise an improvement. I'm not trying to kind of uh, say that it's not, but it's still kind of a, a little bit kind of symbolic. So 32 speeches that I analysed over two years, 18 mentioned this idea of inclusivity, diversity, but only four explicitly mentioned the role of women in that. So again, this is kind of this idea of, you know, it's more about advertising, more about the inclusion than it is about actually talking and exploring through in more kind of focus about what the women, again, more focused on advertising. So quickly, I'll go through a little kind of examples. So this is a speech from Eddie Kenny in 2016. The schools program and other initiatives like Proclamation Day, that was a day in schools in which they brought through the Irish Proclamation which is kind of like the Irish uh, Declaration of Independence, let's say. And they got them to read it out. Anyway, uh, the proclamation may have led to an openness and inclusiveness of debate around 1916, uh, national history and energy that many did not expect, to ensure that we create a legacy that captures a generous and inclusive spirit for the year. So again, you see construction, openness, inclusivity, this inclusive spirit of the year. A lot of attention is going towards saying, this is great, this is really inclusive, this is so on and so forth. 2016 will belong to everyone on this island. This is a year for all the Irish people. We do not need to create of differences, but we need to embrace others. We especially respect the emphasis on inclusivity, mutual tolerance, and authenticity. So again, constructing these ideas, these kind of almost vague ideas of inclusiveness. Again, it's these commemorations are very inclusive, but not saying who's included, not what the details of it. It's very vague, very open, very kind of airy fairy kind of ideas about it. Now on to President Higgins, uh, a little bit more kind of in depth. Uh, focus. An important element of this year's centenary celebrations have been the inclusion, indeed the restoration of the contribution of women and their pivotal role in the struggle for independence. As President of Ireland, it's very great pleasure to have the opportunity to acknowledge the great contribution of Irish women to East Horizon. So, you know, the four speeches talk about the women, they were all President Higgins. Uh, and he goes in, the, you know, uh, quite a lot of depth about the, the role of women, particularly on special events that were just for women. Uh, so there was one on International Women's Day, in which he was just celebrating the women. But again, like my argument is that it's kind of not, it's not necessarily integrated into the narrative, but it's more kind of a side kind of pocket of this is what the women's kind of roles is. And then, you know, kind of it's almost symbolic. And then there's more focus on, oh, we've included them now, kind of thing. Uh, okay, uh, another quick one then. Uh, very great pleasure to have this opportunity to acknowledge the great contribution of Irish women, uh, the vital part that women play, the forgotten women, they're not forgotten anymore. Again, so focus on constructing you know, the, the, the back end kind of thing. Okay, so, second half, what I'm going to talk about now is uh, the discourse of the eight, which is excluding the North. So, you can't talk about the 1916 rising, you can't talk about the motives of the rebels without talking about Northern Ireland. You know, it was part of their idea to have a 32-county republic, and that was their goal from the start. Um, and the state has been constantly, you know, kind of holding up this idea about we need to look at how great these leaders were and their aspirations were, but they're not talking about Northern Ireland. Okay? It's, now, my argument is because of the legacy, obviously, of the Troubles. They don't want to start kind of conflict there again. Um, but again, on the one hand, we're talking about how inclusive and diverse it is. And, but then you're excluding who, the individuals who feel that they are the chief inheritors of 1916, which is the armed republicans. Okay? Particularly armed republicans in Northern Ireland, they see themselves as the inheritors of 1916. They are part of this tradition that the Irish state and the Republic has kind of uh, left behind. So, uh, it's distance. Northern Ireland is very rarely mentioned. It's glossed over. You know, um, like I said, there's all this talk of worshipping the ideas of 1916, but Northern Ireland is kind of left out of that. It's kind of in this negative zone. It's not really talked about. Um, so, it casts this doubt on inclusion as well. You know, kind of, on one hand, they're talking about including all traditions and all respecting all elements of it, but then there's no focus on 
you know, the individuals who feel that they are the chief inheritors. So much so that uh, there was a state event during the Easter and uh, Sinn Féin and Republicanism felt that they had to do their own kind of parade and this kind of well organized outside of the state because they felt that they weren't being represented from a state perspective. And um, so, kind of a little quote here, memories of 1916 rising are heavily policed and directed by a moral compass. And the Irish government, sensitive to its current beliefs, values and, and uh, memories, regard, regardless of past ones, have sought to create a regime of truth. So they tried to own the monopoly of 1916. Uh, and they, it, it's complicated because uh, they're trying to, you know, draw on this idea of armed revolution and great heroic kind of narratives, but also suppress this idea that this should happen in Northern Ireland as well. They're trying to have best of both worlds, kind of. Um, so it's a little bit problematic, I think. Um, like I said, 32 uh, kind of republic was a political goal. Um, the complicated social conditions um, have manifested then as a suppression of armed republicanism. So on the one hand, they're saying, we're great that these heroes in 1916 did this, but we don't want that now. It's kind of mixed kind of, you know, kind of messages. Um, and the gulf, this gulf is then uh, constructed between, you know, the armed republicans in, in, of the 1960s in Northern Ireland and those of 1916. And then obviously Northern Ireland is excluded completely. Uh, so both, you know, kind of champion this idea of uh, inclusiveness, but both fail to address the chief inheritance. Uh, and the legacy of these armed republicanisms, and um, they have this long shadow because some scholars argued that after 1966, which was the 50th anniversary of the 1916 Rising, that uh, celebrations in the Republic, which were quite high, it brought a knock-on effect of violence in Northern Ireland. Now that's since been uh, kind of disclaimed by historians in that it's a little bit of an oversimplification of the problem. A lot of the um, issues that started in Northern Ireland were about civil rights movements, and they you know kind of came separately towards this idea of just, it was the Irish calling for a uh, you know, celebration of this. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the state has been dictated by this fear of if we talk about 1916, it's going to cause violence. So they, they kind of put themselves in a box in that they don't own the monopoly, but they want to own the monopoly. And they're fe fearful of where it goes when they start kind of, you know, kind of espousing this idea of uh, fears of unrest and suppression of violence. So, uh, Quickly, some examples. So, 100 years on, we are a democracy that stood the test of time. We've experienced grief and tragedy on our island. So, a little bit about kind of uh, unconscious uh, discourse and the idea of we, us, our, these are all about subconsciously including you into this idea of a collective. So, Michael Billig, he's uh, another national scholar, he talks about the idea of when, when politicians say we, us, are, you know, they allow you yourself um, have this sociological imagination in which you. Uh, are going well. He's talking about our nation, so it's our Irishness. So it's left up to the reader, and it's this idea of collectively creating this sense of you know community. So when I say our children, you know, kind of need a better future, again, it's the idea that the politician, the Irish politician, is reproducing this shared idea that you have to fit this unconscious reality that oh yeah, you're talking about Irish children, so on and so forth. So he's talking about our island that we are us. We are the economic stores. Uh, we've caused them to all to our communities with cyber crisis emerged uh, stronger. So again, it's a subconscious kind of reality of, he's talking about Ireland, but he's talking about our island, he's talking about traditions on our island, and he's not quite sure where he's, is he talking about Northern Ireland with that or not? Again, it's, it's unclear, it's, it's, and this is the kind of the distinctive part of this discourse strategy, it's avoided, it's hard to kind of, uh, to show you in that, because it's the very lack of its existence, it's, it's uh, in through the speeches itself. So we work to build a peace and reconciliation in Northern Ireland and continue to do so in the context of the Good Friday Agreement. We will seek to imagine the future in ways in which strengthen the peace and reconciliation and respect all traditions and vision and the ideas of the proclamation. So in the first time you were talking about we go to heart, now he's talking about Northern Ireland, you can see the opposite effect of it. It's in Northern Ireland. It's the traditions of Northern Ireland. So it's that distance, that kind of um, outward kind of um, construction of these kind of words. So on to Higgins. Higgins is also guilty of doing this as well. The Irish tricolour takes us back to the roots of the modern democratic movement. The Irish tricolour is the Irish flag, green, white, and orange. Uh, the white in the centre signifies a lasting truce between orange and green, and trust that beneath it falls in the hands of the Irish Protestant, and the Irish Catholic clergy class, and generous and growth both. Thus, our nation flag is primarily an emblem of peace and a call for solidarity, mutual trust, sisterhood, and brotherhood to become the enduring symbols of the Irish nation. So my point is here is 
there's mention of Northern Ireland, there's mention of Protestant and Irish Catholics, but it's very kind of, you know, kind of uh, removed from its context, you know, now. And like the Irish flag in 1916 was all about these kind of ideas of the two kind of republic, and it's kind of touched and glossed over very quickly. So, conclusion. Northern Ireland excluded on two grounds. The legacy of state violence. So the legacy of, obviously, armed insurrection and armed you know, kind of, uh, terrorism in Northern Ireland means that the state is afraid of championing the idea of 1916 is going to cause this kind of year again. Secondly, uh, there's a lack of ritual means of production. So in the Republic, the political establishment is set up to, you know, the, the uh, 26 county and the, the established order, the political establishment, um, are not going to go against that because of the relationship they have with the UK, with the EU. You know, the, the Republic is invested in upholding the Good Friday Agreement. So the idea is that the, the state preparations um, through the political kind of lens of the Republic, um, there's no um, mechanism there for this idea of the state to count the arm Republicanism to infiltrate into the state commemorations. Um, so hopefully I've tried to show that there's been a large focus on this idea of inclusion and uh, on uh, diversity, but Northern Ireland is excluded from the narrative. So I'm not trying to advocate for a champion of you know, armed republicanism. I'm just trying to highlight this problematic kind of relationship that on the one hand you're bigging up these heroes of the nation and the heroic acts against the, these evil British Empire, but then on the other hand people, individuals who feel that they did the exact same thing, you're condemning as well. So it's either, you know, kind of, it's just a, a, an, an unsettling and problematic kind of relationship, I think. Um, and then hopefully I've showed as well that on the one hand you're including the women, but on the other hand you're excluding and all that as well, and that these, these events themselves are inherently both about inclusion and exclusion. They're you know, kind of part of the same kind of thing. All right, thank you very much.